So good afternoon, and welcome to what will be, I'm sure, a terrific conversation. We're delighted to, to welcome um, Larry Fink, Chairman and CEO of BlackRock. Uh, just a few words about um, today's conversation. We like to say here at the school that uh, we're a pl place that develops people and, ide and ideas that can transform the challenges of the 21st century into opportunities to deliver value for business and society. And I think that uh, Larry's talk certainly uh, is, is, is focusing on one of the central uh, challenges of the 21st century. Um, just a few uh, words on, 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 on ground rules here. Um, so after uh, Larry gives his speech, and then I'll give Larry a proper introduction in just a second, uh, my predecessor Tom Cooley will, uh, will moderate Q&A. Uh, I have to step out to, uh, to attend a faculty meeting at 1230. I tried to get Tom to trade places with me and manage the faculty meeting, <laughs> but he said no thank you. So um, <laughs> Tom will handle the Q&A. So we're really enormously delighted and thrilled to have uh, not only chairman and CEO of, uh, of BlackRock, but really one of the extraordinary uh, business leaders of our times here with us. Larry was named uh, CEO of the Decade by Financial News in 2011, and has been named one of the world's best CEOs uh, by Barron's for seven, seven consecutive years. Uh, it's, it's really just phenomenal. And in addition to running uh, BlackRock and interacting with leaders around the world, thinking about the importance of investment allocation and capital allocation. Uh, Larry also finds time to serve as a member of the Board of Trustees of, of New York University, and he's also co-chairman of the NYU Lango Medical Center Board of Trustees. So Larry, welcome to NYU Stern. Welcome to the podium. We're delighted to have you with us. Well, welcome, everyone. Uh, Dean Henry, thank you for that kind introduction. Um, normally, I try to ad lib speeches, but I, uh, today I'm going to be reading a speech because I think it's so important to talk about what the subject matter that I'm going to speak about that's going to impact all the students here. And this is why we wanted to do this at a student forum. We did not want to do this at a typical business forum, but I wanted to sit down with all of you and talk to you about some of the issues we have in front of us today. Uh, so, uh, once again, thank you for taking your time. Uh, hopefully, uh, the box lunch is uh, a good one. Um, so, I want to talk about the subject of old age, something that's really, you know, you're all connected with, about that issue. Uh, I know it seems far off, um, but it should be on the top of your mind. At least it should be something that you think about after you secured your job. Because longevity is a defining challenge of our age. It will affect our financial security. It will affect our tax bills, our job prospects in the future. In short, all of our future and the future of our global economy. When I was growing up, the United States was launching the Great Society, which thought to uh, summons the resources of government to wipe out poverty. Today, the same generation that came of uh, age with the Great Society is headed for retirement and giving you a Great Society where we need to summon up all the greater resources to meet their needs. If you were born in 1950, a couple years before I was, the average life expectancy at birth in the United States was about 68 years. Today, it's closer to 80 years. In addition, if you make it to 65 years, chances that you have at least two more decades of life. And that's just an average. About one in four Americans who is 65 today will live to 90. One in 10 will live to 95. <clears throat> and nearly one third of babies born two years ago will live to 100. Longer lives, that's great news. We spend all our time focusing on health and, and preservation of life. But is this good news? Are we prepared for it? But this might be a very expensive blessing because people today spend twice as much years in retirement as their parents or grandparents did. All of us have to find ways to fund this longer lifespan. And those longer lives are coinciding with a dramatic drop in birth rates here in the United States, in Europe, in Japan, 
and in China. We, meaning we have fewer workers supporting the elderly. In China, the one-child policy has left single children with a heavy burden supporting their parents and their own household, driving savings rates as high as 35% as disposable income. One of the re chief reasons why China's economy has begun to slow down a little bit. It is not because of Europe, it is because consumption has not kept pace with the growth of the, of the Chinese society. <clears throat> The bill for the Gray Society is already coming due and overloading public budgets. Social Security and Medicare payments have exceeded revenues for years now, helping drive up deficits and debt and crowding out spending. Meanwhile, generous pension benefits have been a huge contributor to the debt crisis of Europe. The Gray Society is creating a drag on markets and the economy. One estimate that this Gray Society is going to reduce growth by at least one full percentage points. It's holding back Europe and can depress Japan's GDP by one percentage point over the next couple years, maybe even decades. So this is going to have large global consequences for the global economy. And particularly, and one of the reasons why I wanted to be here today, the Gray Society is restricting uh, job opportunities for younger people as older people stay in the workforce longer because they have no alternative. In Europe, one in four of people under 24 is unemployed. In some countries like Spain, the unemployment rate is approaching 50%. Recently, I was with the Irish finance minister, Michael Noonan, uh, who recently said the most pressing problem facing Europe is the fact that European policymakers are ignoring the crisis facing young people. Here in the United States, a recent paper by two noted economists argue that an aging workforce is one of the current reasons why the recovery has been so slow, and that jobless recoveries will be now the norm. I'm not that gloomy. Actually, I've been quoted on talking about what, well, you know, I love the equity markets and why I think markets will do better, because I do believe college education can be an enormous help, especially if we could direct people to grow uh, into growth areas like technology, healthcare, energy, and engineering, and, and in business. The unemployment rate for, graduate, uh, for college grads is actually under 4% in the United States today. But the simple fact that as older people work longer, young people are being displaced. Total employment among those without a college, age, uh, uh, without a college education is actually continuing to fall. So we're seeing a, two, a bifurcated society today. So the Gray Society, with all its challenges, is global. It is real. It is something that we need to focus on today. It's already burdening governments, depressing economies, and suppressing job opportunities. And no one, no one has done enough to get ready. Governments have not proven that they're ready. The president's budget plan projects that Social Security and Medicare out uh, outlays will both rise more than 70% by 2023. This is clearly unsustainable. State and local government pensions are underfunded by nearly a trillion dollars. Companies are not ready. The top, 10, the top 100 corporate pension plans are already nearly a half a trillion underfunded. And then individuals aren't ready. According to the Employee Benefit Research Institute, only two-thirds of Americans have saved anything for retirement, anything. And most workers have saved less than $25,000. So we're not ready for this gray society. Governments, business, and individuals. And the question is why? The answer is that we've let the three legs of traditional retirement tools, Social Security, pension and personal savings get rickety. Retirees now depend on Social Security for 70% of their income. Social Security is an essential part of our retirement system here in the United States. But Social Security was never intended to do the job alone. And it's a system that was established for different demographics. 
When Social Security was launched in 1935, a 21-year-old male had a 50-50 chance of living to 65. And uh, in 1960, five workers were paying into the system for every retiree. Now it's only three workers. And in 2035, it'll just be two. And while the solutions may seem obvious, adjusting benefits, raising the retirement age, these are really difficult and should be emotional issues. In many states, states and local governments are obligated to pay these benefits. It is a government obligation to pay these benefits. So how do we address this? This is a society problem. We all need to be debating this. This can't just be one you know, part of our country, government. It has to be government, business, and individually. Society has to start addressing it instead of kicking the can down the, down the road. The second leg of the traditional road retirement stool was a so-called defined benefit pension plan. These are the traditional pension plans that provide a set of income during retirement. They are managed by employers and mostly or completely funded by them. <clears throat> but after the last 30 years, we've had a massive shift away from the defined benefit plans to the private sector. Employers found that they simply could not afford to support the liabilities created by baby boomers uh, aging and their liabilities rose. So companies responded by freezing these pension plans and shifting, shifting the retirement risk and burden to the individuals through so-called defined contribution plans such as 401ks where workers save for their own retirement. This is a seismic shift from collective responsibility for retirement to individual responsibility. But we never sufficiently warned people about this new responsibility. We never educated them enough as to how to meet their future needs. As a, result, as a result, the defined contribution system simply isn't doing the job. As of 2011, only about half of private sector workers were covered by an employee-sponsored retirement plan of any kind. And less than 40% of employees are participating. That means the majority of private sector workers aren't participating in this vital part of the nation's retirement system. And even where employers often, often plan less than 7% of eligible employees max out on their 401ks uh, in 2010, despite the benefits in doing so. Which brings me to the third leg of retirement systems, private savings, where too many investors are simply not equipped for success. In a recent BlackRock, BlackRock survey, which we're, we're announcing the results today, more than half of the investors were worried about outliving their savings. But at the same time, nearly three of four said it was more important to keep the money that they now have safe than to try to generate the returns they need for the future. When individuals manage their own retirement savings, whether it's a 401k or taxable accounts, we see that they invest much more in traditional fixed income products uh, than when they were in defined benefit plans, the money was in a defined benefit pension plan. And so you see a change in behavior. But in today's environment, that's not going to deliver the returns you need. So why aren't people taking the steps needed to plan for the retirement? Part of this is investor psychology. I'm sure some of you read the book, Thinking Fast, Thinking Slow. The behavioral scientist, Daniel Kahneman, has found that investment behavior is, is not as rational as people, as most people and most economic theories assume. Investors feel more pain when they lose money than the pleasure when they gain. So they often underinvest or do nothing at all when they're left to their own devices. We're not going to change human behavior, but we need to find ways to influence this behavior. Investors also don't take a long-term view. They're, up to, uh, they're also concerned about the noise out there and the ups and downs of the market. After all, just last week, a hoax from a hacker sent the Dow plunging 145 points in an instant. And we lived in a world of 9,000 tweets a second. The entire financial system is wired, and I underscore wired, for the short term. Banks and security firms, they grow revenues on the velocity of money. They make money on clicks. So they have short-term incentives. 
media, they especially traffic in the short term. Especially now with this 24-7 news cycle, they need to draw people and traffic from hyper-focusing on the latest event, which disrupts, I believe, most human behavior in terms of thinking about long-term objectives. So this noise and the concern people have about outliving their savings are ironically driving investors to investments that they perceive to be safer, like traditional bonds. But they should do just the opposite, taking advantage of a longer investment horizons to keep their money working for them. Because let's face it, if you have a 25, a 30, a 40 year term to save for retirement, and then you have 20 to 30 years to fund in retirement, you should not be worrying about what's happening this second, this week, even this quarter. I was asked on a television show a couple weeks ago, Larry, what do you think of Cyprus? And I answered, who cares? Because <laughs> it, it's not relevant. Um, that's all the case given today's e economic landscape. Central banks in the United States, in Europe, and now in Japan have driven interest rates to historic lows to help spur growth with some positive effects on housing, bank lending, energy, corporate investments, and our equity markets. Yet current monetary policy is taking a terrible toll on savers. Pension funds and uh, uh, individuals have long used traditional government bonds to help fund retirement obligations. That actually worked quite well for 30 years on falling inflation, falling interest rates, which to produce over 8% returns over that cycle in treasuries. That just doesn't work today. When the 10-year treasury yields less than 2%, the real risk of people today over allocating in traditional bonds are going to lose money when interest rates rise or the value of the, when their value of the bonds fall, which must happen at one point. This will deprive investors of flexibility and force them to hold the maturity with these low earning instruments to, uh, uh, to get their principal back. A rise in just one-fifth of one percent point of interest rates would mean the loss of the entire year's return on the current long-dated treasury. In other words, the old rule of investing, 60% equities, 40% fixed income, and an increasing share of fixed income, the closer you get to retirement, just won't work today. Investors need to take a different approach and can deliver the higher rate of return they'll need to support these, this longevity, this longer lifespan. They need to be investing in a wider range of equities and bonds. Bonds will continue to play an important role in the investment portfolio, especially as people age. But people can't just rely on treasuries for their bond portfolio. They need to look at a broader range of bonds that can deliver higher re returns or higher yield. And for younger workers, they need more, I'm talking to you guys now, for, uh, they need an objective-based approach that focuses on what are you trying to achieve over a 30, 40, 45-year horizon. And when you start thinking about the value and virtue of compounding, th then it really comes home. If you save $1,000 a month for 30 years with a 3% annual return, close to a 30-year bond today, you'll have less than $600,000 when you reach retirement. But if you invested that $1,000 in something that delivered a 6% return, a reasonable return in many equities over a long horizon, you'll end up with over a million dollars over the same period of time. You need to save more than $1,700 a month or another $700 if you want that million dollars at 3%. So it's just the difference of compounding and why you need to be focusing on this today. By now, I hope most of you understand the problem. So the question is, what do we do about it? Well, I think first, we, the we, we being society, we need to acknowledge there is a crisis, a systemic crisis that is threatening not only our retirement system, but our economic futures. And because of its far reaching effects, a solution needs to be big, urgent, national priority. And it has to be t discussed openly today in a constructive dialogue. The longer we act, the longer we wait to act, the bigger this problem will become. Once we faced up to the crisis of how to finance longer lives, 
We need action on several fronts. First, employers need to step up in every way that they can help workers achieve a secure retirement. Shifting from defined benefit plans to defined contribution plan does not absolve employers from the moral obligation to help employees prepare for retirement. More employees need to be offered plans, auto enrollment plans. All employees need to participate, providing matching funds and educate employees on the absolute necessity of maxing out of their plans. The bottom line is employers need to do more to fund their workers' retirement and educating their workers on the opportunities. They need to be educating their workers on what the virtue of compounding is and they need to help everyone understand this whole issue of longevity. Second, <clears throat> The asset management business, including my company, BlackRock, needs to do a better job as well. As an industry, we need to be measure, measuring our performance not against benchmarks, but against investors' objectives or liabilities. That means much less of focus on short-term sales and products and much more focus on long-term needs. Truly, investors don't care what they are holding, whether it is a mid-cap stock or Mexican government bonds. Investors want product that will provide long-term uh, outcomes to help them buy a house, send their kids to college, or fund a decent retirement. Obviously, we cannot provide absolute certainty. That's never an option with any investment that carries a measure of risk. But we must do a better job in accompanying savers on their life journeys with outcome-oriented solutions that help them understand how to stay on course, how to stay focused, how to stop focusing on the daily news cycle, to focus on things like target date funds, target risk funds, multi-asset solutions made for today's world and tomorrow's goals. And we need to help investors look beyond the headlines, recognizing that successful investing is not about market timing, but about time in the market. It's why at BlackRock we have uh, embarked on an education campaign to get investors focused on broader opportunities in the market and a need for longer term patient outcomes and patient approaches. But in the end, we need to go even further. Given the massive amount of savings needed, as well as investor psychology and the reality of risk aversion, we need a comprehensive solution to retirement savings that includes some form of mandatory retirement savings. Similar to Australia's successful superannuation funds or the new pension requirements in the United Kingdom. For example, in Australia, every part time, I want to underline part time, every full time employee from age 18 to 70 must contribute a portion of their income into the superannuation fund, which then belongs to the employee. It was launched 20 years ago when, when the country was looked ahead uh, uh, to the crisis that it was facing and it paying its own retirement. At the start, the contribution was only 3%. Today, it's gradually now 9% of income, and it's paid by the employer. The individuals can actually make additional uh, contributions on top of that. In 2020, in Australia, they're going to raise it to 12% contribution as they look at the demographics that they need to uh, put more into it. The superannuation funds have been a huge success in supplanting the government pension scheme and taking the strain off the Australian government. Truly an attractive prospect as we think about how to relieve part of the burden that we have in our government with Social Security. In just 20 years, we're talking not a big country. We're not talking about a country that has that large a population. There is more than $1.6 trillion in assets held in these accounts in 20 years. Giving Australians one of the highest per capita retirement savings pool in the world. There are some good models on our side of the Pacific as well, a pooled fund for small employers like CalPERS, the state uh, employee pension fund in, in uh, California. Perhaps we could do something similar nationally by opening up a highly successful thrift savings program for federal employees to all workers. That's the model being adopted nationally in the UK with the creation of the Nest Plan. Or we could model a solution on successful pools already created before small employers and not for profit. But the point is, the current system is not working. And we need a comprehensive approach that includes some form of mandatory savings in addition to Social Security. Let me talk about Social Security for a second. 
In the U.S., individuals contribute 6.2% of their wages, up to $113,000, to, the, to their retirement system, and employers match another 6.2%. So we have a total of approximately 12% of our wages invested uh, 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 with a Social Security fund. Um, and over the 30 to 40 years, this generates a comfortable foundation for retirement, but not the totality of retirement. But instead, many Americans are worried about the future of their Social Security and their 401ks and their IRS, IRAs that are, aren't uh, sufficient to meet their needs. The current system simply isn't working and the longer we fix it the tougher the task becomes we need to start today before the debate becomes greater and greater of course a mandatory savings system would need to be phased in gradually in order not to create a shock to our economy but it would relieve pressure of our federal budget and and the markets would be uh, welcoming that and uh, and i think actually the markets would welcome it quite quite well but most importantly, it would relieve the crisis of financing longevity that will be a drag on our economy, a drag on job creation for years to come if we don't deal with it soon. Finally, as tomorrow leaders, I'd like to ask you two things. The first is simple. If you're not saving for your retirement already, start today. If you're working even just in the summer, max out in your 401ks. If you're not, start an IRA and contribute something, anything, however much you can. I know it's hard to put money aside, especially when you're a student or making ends meet. It always involves trade-offs. I can tell you, I'm going through trade-offs every day today. We all live in a world of making trade-offs. But the longer you wait on this trade-off, the bigger your burden in the future will be. Longevity should be a blessing. And as an investor, it provides you opportunities to benefit from compounding and to have a longer investment horizon. But if you don't prepare for it, you are left with two options. You're going to work longer in life, perhaps much longer than you ever anticipated, which we are seeing already in our, uh, in our society, and we're seeing this all throughout Europe. Or when, when you're adults and you're seeking, you know, nearing retirement, you better be good to your children if you have children, <laughs> because you're going to want them to take care of you. And that's going to become a bigger and bigger burden. And I would, also, so I would also tell you, you should tell your parents, if they're not getting adequate retirement at this moment, they better be good to you. So, <laughs> so we have some big issues that we need to address. Um, second, I hope that all of you speak out. Longevity is an issue of so social justice that will have a more profound impact on your generation than any generation before. And if we don't start addressing it, not just in this country, but globally, we're going to see fewer job prospects for younger people, higher unemployment, lower growth, and many pe older people, maybe your parents, left without the means to support themselves. So let me repeat myself again. The challenge we all face with this gray society is enormous and enormously complex, enormously emotional. Demographics forces are having a seismic effect on the way we live and the way our economies work. They are straining our budgets and skewing the markets. But I have no doubt that we have all the intellectual capital, including here at NYU, all the ingenuity and the determination. If we put our minds to it, if we get society debating this and talking about it, I am confident we can make longevity a blessing. With that, thank you, and I'll open it up for questions. Thank you, Larry, for uh, uh, talking to us about this incredibly important topic. Um, I'm going to moderate the Q&A, so if you'd like to ask a question, raise your hand, and, and uh, we'll, we have microphones, and we'll uh, we'll call on you, but I'm going to use the uh, moderator's privilege and ask the first question myself. Oh, okay, so, good. Um, one of the things you've called for is a massive increase in savings. And so the question, and I, I certainly understand the logic of that. The question is, what will be the feedback of that big increase in savings on returns, on returns on equity? So more savings, more investment more investment in lower return projects, presumably. So 
Uh, is that is that a problem? Well, there's no question. Is more money? Is this on? I think it is. Is more money um, is invested? Uh, obviously, uh, uh, returns will be mitigated somehow. Uh, um, and I would also say, Tom, the biggest challenge we have as investors is there's just not enough investable assets worldwide. This is why we we, we are sitting in a, in a market where rates are so low, and why equity markets continue to rally. But I would say one of the big reasons why equities are rallying more than most of the gadflies talking about it has been this recognition, I don't know if I want my duration in 30-year bonds today because, you know, getting back to my compounding at 3%. So where are you going to get your duration? Yeah. And with longevity, and the only way you're going to get, dura dura you know, your duration, especially and if you have a long horizon, is going to be in equity. So, yeah. yes, I do believe equity markets will continue to, to do better. Obviously, I, am, I don't believe we're going to have... Um, a, a burdensome economy. I do believe over the next 10 years, global GDP will be growing modestly at 3%, 3.5%. So you're, you're right in asserting that if more money goes into investable assets, by definition, returns will be mitigated. Um, but I think um, as, we, as we see rising equity markets, you're going to see more IPOs, you're going to see a, a, gro a, greating gro a, a, a larger global capital markets, you're going to see more and more uh, markets open, whether it is China or other areas where you're going to see opportunities in the world. I would say in the last five years after the crisis, global capital markets are growing faster um, than, uh, than I would say uh, than they were obviously beforehand before, during the crisis. And so as long as global capital markets continue to grow, I think there'll be enough investable opportunities for investors. Great. Uh, up here in the left. Um, Larry, could you describe the mandatory savings program a little bit more? Uh, what percentage of that would the employee be contributing in, in under your view? And and is this in, in addition to a 401k, which people are already having trouble uh, funding on their own? Uh, so this almost feels well, like uh, a tax. I know it's not, but it, yeah. but it'd be required. Um, and and finally, uh, what are you doing besides talking about it to get this all done? Uh, do you have contacts in Washington? Are you have you put proposals out there? So, a, I am, uh, you know, I'm not here to suggest what, how, what percent. I'm not suggesting this is, should supplant 401k. Just like there's a new debate talking about we need to overhaul tax in America, we need to overhaul retirement. So we spent so much time talking about the overhauling of tax, and uh, obviously not much has been done yet. We really need to overhaul how we think about retirement. So. Uh, I'm not here to just suggest whether you know a, a mandatory fund should be three or four or five percent, and what percent should business uh, should be uh, paying. One thing I would I could say uh, with great certainty, as we overhaul retirement, we have to make retirement benefits for all workers, part time and and full time. I think that's one of the substantive difference between us and many other countries, but. So my overall theme is, is a full exhaustive review in a comprehensive way have, uh, uh, on how we deal with retirement and how we think about retirement, which encompasses you know, a conversation on Social Security, a conversation on uh, the corporation's responsibilities, uh, individual responsibilities. So I'm not here to talk about how this, what will be the ultimate outcome. Have I discussed this? I've discussed this quite noisily in Washington and in Europe. And it, we're, we're just beginning uh, this type of conversation. And uh, we'll be louder as a firm on this. Yes. Hi. Thank you, Mr. Frank, for your time today. I really appreciate your words. Um, the central theme, it seemed to me, was, and something I've noticed in my time here at Stern, is the shift from the short-term viewpoint from to the short-term viewpoint from the long-term. Uh, you touched about it in kind of our media coverage. I think it extends to our focus on quarterly earnings and our election cycles as well. Um, so my question to you is, one, in your experience, when do you think this shift occurred? Um, and two, how can we change our compensation structure for businesses and, em and for uh, employees to continue to shift us back to that long-term focus? Well, a, I don't think it's any one thing that we woke up in the morning and we went from long term to short run. I think it's been, a, 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 um, I think it's um, it, it been a long process. So I've been in the financial markets now 37 years. Um, I think a, much of it had to do with as we started introducing more and more financial products. Um, it, you know, I think it, having a, a larger and larger capital markets has a, allowed 
you know, the markets to trade with much more frequency. I think the having technology interface now, having you know, uh, high frequency trading, the, all of this has moved and moved without trying to ask yourself, what are our objectives? And what is, what is society's objectives? But then uh, you, you overlay that with how media is now looking at everything. Uh, so it's a combination of, of the evolution through technology of media, evolution of technology of how uh, capital markets have evolved. Um, I would even say good, what we define good governance is even more short term. I mean, one of the definitions of good corporate governance today is have annual review of board directors. Is that the right thing? I mean, boards are mostly important when you have crises in firms. You want longevity in boards during that crisis. I mean, I'm not talking about 10 years, but you know, staggered boards in my mind make more sense, but good governance says it should be annually elected and that's so BlackRock changed their rules. So I think everything has moved to short term. How about accounting? I think accounting has moved a lot more to short termism. So we now are, you know, right now in Europe, they're talk, you know, t talking about a new way of looking at insurance called Solvency II. And it's, so after World War II, insurance companies were the largest investors of infrastructure uh, building projects in America and in Europe. A major insurance company in Europe cited uh, last week in a meeting I was with that in 2005, they had 15% of their balance sheet in equities. Today, they won't even go above three. Why? Under Solvency II, under, new, under, under accounting guidelines today, you're looking at their, their assets with one year volatility. And that will determine what type of impairment they have. They never look at the liability. Getting back to objective-based investing. So I, I would criticize everything related to how we even look at accounting as much more short-termism. So it's not just bonus behavior, it's even accounting behavior that has now become much more short-term. Even governance moving short-term. I think the biggest issue we have, and I'm sure you're all faced with this, um, uh, how to live your life um, over a cycle, even a 24-hour cycle, without having a, a, some type of phone device and, and everything is so much shorter. Um, even the way we, we communicate on a device today, it's all hyphenated and, and short term, you know. So everything is short term in how we think. And, and unfortunately in my view is so many people can't overcome what is good fact and what is noise. And so we need to modify our behavior, all of us, about, you know, about how we live and how, you know, we need to sit back sometime during the day and think about what is our objective. I know, you know, the same way when you go, when, when you come to NYU, your objective is to do well, your objective is to get a great education, to build for a great career. Now, you may have those objectives, but you, uh, how often during your day do you think about those long-term objectives? And, you know, I, I just think the same type of behavior as you plan out your life and your future, you know, we need to intersect that. So it's not just, as I said, it is society that has become so short-termism. You cited the political cycle historically. Politicians used to only um, uh, r run for re-election about three months before the candidate, and now it's 24-7 when they're running for office. Congre you know, the men and women in, in the House have two-year cycles, so that, that, that means they're always running for election. And so this behavior is, 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 in my mind, one of the great problems we have today in society. You're in the center. It, so, I mean, if you're, your investment horizon is very different if you're 55 years old or if you're 30 years old or 25 years old. Um, so if, if, if I were recommending an investment strategy for all of you, um, you know, as I said uh, on television about in October 11, I said it again this year, you know, I'd be 100% in equities. Um, I don't know of anything that has a long duration um, other than equities. Now, um, and, and it would be a global portfolio of large cap companies that pay a, a dividend of some sort. Um, the duration of dividend stocks is actually shorter than the duration of um, fixed 30-year uh, bonds today because you're getting a higher coupon on the dividend side. So it actually, it actually has less volatility. 
Um, if you're 55, though, and you want to retire at 62, that's a whole different issue. But, the, but the, my, my worry about the 55-year-old who still wishes to uh, retire at 62, have they factored in they may live to 90? And so what we traditionally thought of the allocation of mix of bonds and, and equities for that 55-year-old, that should be questioned now, too. What, what percent of, of bonds are you sitting with? If you believe you have a, you know, you're coming from a family of a, that have, has longevity on your side. And so um, I'm not s suggesting there's one solution, one objective for everybody. I would also say some people are just totally risk adverse, can't, can't overcome the volatility in the marketplace. And I would say be 100% in bonds, but then you're going to have to put a greater allocation of your disposable income uh, to meet the needs of retirement. So I'm, I'm not here to, to, to tell you and, the, and, and, the, and to um, direct where you should go. It's, a, it's an individual decision based on I guess your genetic pool about longevity, but it's also based on your personal issues, your personal needs. Um, what I'm trying to raise the bar in is educating the knowledge of what it takes to go from a 25-year-old young worker to ultimate retirement and you have the adequacy of retirement. Yes, in the back row. structures and their pay structures so that you can make sure employees are rewarded for achieving that kind of a goal for their clients because I would imagine that would be one of the most difficult things for you guys to accomplish right now. It's pretty easy. Okay. It's, it's actually, <laughs> <laughs> in fact, there's not even an issue. First of all, uh, specifically, specifically asset managers, um, if we don't do our job, our clients could fire us daily. That's uh, all the open end funds. If you don't like what we're doing, you could you could redeem and get out. Our, all our institutional managers could fire us within 30 days. So let's start off. We and you could see it when we have great performance, we are we grow our assets. When we have lousy performance, we lose our assets really rapidly. There's a there's pretty good transparency uh, in, in our business, and it is a performance based business. In terms of uh, compensation. Um, I could, I'm pretty proud of how BlackRock compensates our employees. We have never subordinated our shareholder ever. We have had a bonus pool of approximately 35% of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of, of pre-tax uh, uh, income. Um, most of the security firms are 45 plus, and times it goes over 60%. But more importantly, every employee at the firm uh, starts off um, with at least 30% of their compensation deferred, and most of it is in the form of equities. And when you are high income provider uh, earners, you get uh, as much as 60% of your compensation is deferred over a three year period of time. And then for the leadership of BlackRock, we have equity plans that are, that are five year uh, uh, in terms, and you have to be there to get it. You have to have, uh, be in good standing. Um, and, um, and so, I think there are many um, carrots and sticks uh, in the investment and management business, but the most important stick is our clients could leave immediately. And it's a pretty, uh, you're, you're reminded every day when you see these massive outflows in the badly performing funds, you're reminded pretty quickly that we're a performance oriented or, uh, business. And I think that's a pretty good, uh, you know, uh, component. I would also say about BlackRock, compared to a lot of other firms, 100% of our revenues are, are advisory revenues or fiduciary revenues. We have no business that competes with our clients. And that's one of the tr main tra differences between BlackRock and so many other firms. I will not allow us to compete with our clients. So we have no balance sheet other than what we need for regulatory reasons and working capital. But you know, we've, we've modeled ourselves with uh, the whole idea that we're going to build an investment and risk management firm on the idea that we are going to be a fiduciary in everything we do, nothing more. 
Um, we were very, uh, one of the reasons our stock's up, I don't know, 16, 17 times since we did our IPO, I've never subordinated my shareholders to employee comp, um, and our employee comp is based on performance. Charlie. Larry, how should, uh, how should the students think about the future in equity with respect to active management versus ETFs versus indexing? Well, we're making a bet in both. I mean, we're the largest ETF provider in the world. We're the largest indexer in the world. And yet I'm, I've spent uh, large sums of money of reinvesting in my active equity teams. Uh, we, pro we have really transformed our active equity teams over the last few years in the US. Uh, we've added a lot of U uh, uh, global equity teams in, in Hong Kong. Uh, and we continue to add our teams in London. Um, I think they both play a great role for investors. Um, we are seeing, uh, obviously the marketplace has seen huge inflows um, in, in the uh, beta business. Uh, in the first quarter, BlackRock had $34 billion in inflows in equities. We never even had years with $34 billion in inflows. <laughs> and most firms are pretty, you know, never see that type of flow. And almost all of the, all the flows was in beta or in uh, ETFs and index funds. Why? I see a whole change of investor behavior. Clients are now spending a lot more time on where should they allocate the money instead of trying to find the very best manager. And if you actually look at all the studies, if you properly asset allocate properly, that will be, you will make enormous more alpha by overweighting different regions through beta and all that stuff. So you're seeing a whole new class of investors. However, I believe as more and more money, Charlie, moves into beta, it's going to be easier for active managers to make returns. So, you know, that's a pretty big contrarian view. And here we are, the largest beta manager, the bar largest beneficiary of that. But I believe there will be a day when active management will have its day, and maybe money will be moving out of beta back into, uh, into alpha products. But uh, at the moment, um, we're the only firm that has uh, a large scale in both sides, and we could have active dialogues with our clients. Keep in mind, I don't tell, you know, our clients are coming to us in most cases that, you know, what do you think about the emerging world? What do you think about this? And how should I play that? And we, we could show them both and let them make a decision on, in terms of the allocation of beta and alpha. But the, the, the dominant theme we've seen for the last year is more and more investors are just using beta as, a, as active because you could over allocate beta, much lower fees, they could they could be more control of what they uh, they're doing and i think that investment style is going to grow and grow this is why we believe uh, ETFs and index products will continue to be very dominant other questions in the back row sir hey Larry, thank you for the speech so uh, now that there are a lot of discussion of the financial regulation and the uh, and i think that the stem professor wrote a few books on so how, my question is, uh, what impact would it be to the asset management business, especially for the uh, BlackRock, and what kind of adjustment do you have to make, and what kind of new role that BlackRock would play in the you know, financial regulation? Um, <clears throat> we welcome a lot of the regulation, and we hate a lot of the other regulation. I mean, it's, <laughs> you know, th there, there's, the financial sectors of the world actually failed society. Okay, let's admit it. Let's try to make sure that society is never harmed again by the financial markets. And so we need regulation to make sure that we protect society again, that if there's losses, shareholders, employees, and maybe bondholders bear the cost, but society never bears that cost. So let's start off with that point. Second of all, we need to make sure markets are fair, more transparent. And BlackRock is very much involved in the, in the workings with the SEC, the CFTC, uh, to move more and more products off the OTC type of exchanges um, and moving like especially derivatives onto exchanges. So you have much more transparency. You have a lot more uh, understanding of what's going on. But in addition, regulators have asked for much more information on a consistent basis. So the CFTC and the F SEC is, uh, has asked now for us to provide daily, uh, um, uh, by daily 
derivative holdings by our clients across all clients' portfolios. Um, so the amount of information that is being pr provided in this new regulation is enormous. So one of the outgrowths of, of all this regulation, which is going to serve society in a better way, we have a lot of, well, quite a bit higher costs. Uh, we are hiring hundreds of, of compliance and legal people to making sure that we are doing our job um, as society and our regulators demand. And this is not just a U.S. issue. This is as big in Europe. So, um, so overall, uh, we think uh, most of the regulation is worthwhile. I have some questions about some of it. I think it, we're overcomplicating a lot of things, but that's another speech. Um, and, and I think uh, the problem is, uh, is balance now. What are we trying to achieve? So, and specifically about asset managers, I, you know, one of the big uh, projects that the government's looking at should asset managers become systemically important designated institutions. We are waiting to hear, as everyone else will be, as to what that report will <coughs> assert. And depending on how that, that comes out, um, you know, I am sure, um, you know, we will, we will adapt to whatever that, that paper suggests. And I'm sure we'll have time to work with the regulators uh, and our politicians on that, uh, on, on whatever that outcome is. Time for one final question there. Yeah, sir, uh, given the uh, central bank actions throughout the world, I'm curious what your view on uh, potential future inflation is and how your firm is or isn't positioning itself around that view. Um, I, I was asked. I was asked to speak at the ECB, um, and we, we, we asked that question quite a bit by clients worldwide, uh, by politicians. I don't. A. I don't see any inflation risk at the moment. As I said earlier, I think uh, there's actually a shortage of investments. Let me step back and talk about the U.S. for a second, which I know the facts pretty well. Uh, Federal Reserve is buying $85 billion of bonds per month. So they're buying about a trillion dollars. In the United States last year, we, we, we raised about $1.1 trillion of new debt, private and public sector. Well, that means we only have $100 billion of, of debt for the private sector to buy. That's why we've seen such lowering rates. Let me add to this problem. In dollar-based assets, there's $950 billion of interest income per year, adding to the need for more bonds. Now, if you add one more statistic, most bonds are trading at premiums. There is now $450 billion of amortization of the premium per year. So what I'm trying to suggest is even without the Fed buying the $85 billion per month, there is huge need for more investable assets. So I'm not worried, as some people are, on the outcomes when the Fed uh, uh, takes their foot off the pedal. Um, at the moment, I look at two statistics related to um, inflation in the United States. I look at employment. I don't think you're going to have wage uh, increases unless you have, I don't know, employment below six and a half, unemployment below six and a half, maybe six. Some, and certainly in some sectors you may see it sooner. And the second thing is factory utilization. Uh, if it, generally when factory utilization is above 84%, it is, it is deemed to be somewhat inflationary. We're in the mid-70s, so combination of excess labor, excess factory util, uh, capacity, I, I, I don't see how inflation is going to be uh, a, a problem in the near term. I, I don't want to speak beyond two years, but in the next two years, I just don't see any issues. Um, and as you look what Japan is doing, I mean, they had 20 odd years of deflation, and so they're now gearing it up to try to get 2% inflation. Now, 2% inflation doesn't seem that big. I mean, we, you know, that, that would be considered a real luxury in the United States. Um, however, even in 1987, 88, when Japan was a, a rocket ship, they didn't have 2% inflation. So for Japan to even achieve 2% inflation, it's a pretty substantial thing. 
So, and, you know, I'm not suggesting something can't go, something may go wrong, but I just, I just don't see it. And I think there's so much demand for investable assets, even without the Fed. Um, there's enough demand to overcome. I'm, and I'm not suggesting, as my speech said, I think rates will ultimately go higher, but, you know, but, but I think it will be moderated by the sheer need for investable assets. Well, Larry, thank you very um, much for this uh, outstanding lecture and for focusing our attention on such an important problem. Uh, please join me in thanking Larry. <laughs> for thank, you. thank you, everyone. <laughs>